Hello, everyone. Welcome to International Lawyer. My name is John Riley, and I'm professor of law at Dongguk University in Seoul, Korea. Today, I have the distinct pleasure and honor to interview Dr. Che Gun Yu, chairman of the Yijin Institute of International Law. As one of the most passionate international lawyers of his time, Dr. Yu graduated from Yonsei University and studied law at the University of California, Davis School of Law. After practicing many for many years in the United States as a human rights attorney, Dr. Yu came back home and served as a representative of the National Assembly of Korea for 12 years, focusing on foreign affairs and national security. He served as chairman of the National Defense Committee. As a leading expert on international and foreign relations, Dr. Yu served as chief of staff for President Kim Dae-jun and as a senior foreign policy advisor in the Nomi Khan administration. He also taught jurisprudence and has published many books and legal articles. Presently, Dr. Yu is dedicating himself to the peace planning through UNESCO and other NGOs. Hello, Dr. Yu. Hi. <laughs> so nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Uh, thank you for having this interview with the jail. Um, it's a great honor for us to talk to one of the foremost international legal experts of the day. I would like to begin the interview with your personal story. Could you please tell us a little bit about your family background and parents' background? Sure. You know, firstly, I, would, I have to say thank you for inviting me to this, you know, television and journal discussion. And when I look through the International Law Journal, which is published by the Asian International Law, uh, there are really distinct law professors and authorities who are in the past, but I'm not quite a proper person <laughs> here, but it's too humble. Thank you for <laughs> you know your time and your effort to bring me to this wonderful meeting. <laughs> I was born in Korea, 1937. 75 years ago. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Just a, one week ago, the, we celebrated Korean Harvest Day or mm -hmm. Korean Thanksgiving Day. Chusa, mm -hmm. that is my birthday. Oh. So my wife and I went to Kalimanto province, mm -hmm. remote area, just to celebrate for 75 long years of my life. <laughs> and we had a really fun time. Anyway, just 75 years, it was not easy life. I went through some you know, difficulties and you know, many hurdles, you know, ups and downs of my life. But I'm very happy now. I have three grown up children and I have eight grandchildren. So even if they are living in the United States and England, still we are really happy to see my children are doing well. And I'm very much happy to have good children of myself. But I was very lonely when I was grow up because I'm the only kid. Mm -hmm. In 1950, when the Korean War broke up, my father was disappeared, presumably kidnapped by North Korean soldier. And ever since 1950 July, no news about my father. So I became a semi-orphan. Mm -hmm. And with my mother and myself, we just went through a very difficult life. But you know, when I look back my life, I had so uh, fortunate enough to have a good person who supported me, helped me out. So I'm okay now. Mm -hmm. And my mother passed away about 10 years ago, year 2002, as age 92 years old, mm -hmm. without seeing her lovely husband for 55 years. And her last will is for me. Son, I'm going to go heaven when you meet your daddy. Tell him I love him so much. And I was overwhelmed to hear that. You know, my mother never you know, expressed, never showed me any loving and tender care. She was a top lady <laughs> to survive in this you know, society, in this world. But very last moment of her life, she just confessed her loving you know, feeling to her husband. So I was deeply impressed. And second, Word when you know dying will was since you are chairman of the National Defense Committee and work for the unification of this country, expedite for the unification of this country. So many widows and separate family. We are recently estimating about 10 million Korean families separated during Korean War. You know, 
they are crying every day and longing for their separate family. So you have to work hard to comfort them, taking them, entertaining them. That's a natural conversation. Don't forget that things. You should close your eyes and that to yourself. I never forget that last minute of my mother. I'm just working hard. Uh, I worked hard when I was in National Assembly as a politician, but after retired from politics, now a civilian person, it's a simple lawyer, and I'm working with several NGO organizations, voluntarily involved in peacemaking, mm -hmm. welfare, and human rights activities. So, you know, I'm just uh, happy now. So, how did your experiences during the Japanese occupation and Korean War help shape your professional and personal lives? I went to elementary school, the Japanese elementary school, for mm -hmm. one year, 1944, when I was age eight. And after one year, you know, school in Japanese school, liberation came to Korea Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Second World War was ended, and Korea became an independent country, of course. But you know, within five years, 1950, Korean War broke out. So. My father and Korean leaders were ready for the new country, Korea, independent country, but before we were fighting, the Korean War broke out. Mm -hmm. So Korea was absolutely devastating. And luckily, with the 16 United Nations forces, and particularly the United States, supported Korea. They helped the Korean War, fought against the you know, communists, and Chinese Red communists came down to Korea, so we became a okay country now, but uh, through this period I you know, studied hard to take care of my mother and my grandmother was with me. So I'm the only one male person at home. So I became a head of house household when I was age 13. And that was since that time still I'm head of household. And my grandmother and mother of course both passed away a long time ago. But when I look back on my life, you know, sometimes I was deeply frustrated. You know, I felt this is impossible to survive in this, you know, severely competitive Korean society. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I was able to go to university, and I was luckily to to America to study law. I came back as a, you know, well-educated person, so I served for Korean governments and private sector. Did your relationship with your father influence your political ideology and your your decision to become a lawyer? Very honestly speaking, it's a shameful, you know, confession. But my father married my mother when he was age fifteen. Wow. And my mother was age nineteen. They never met before marriage. It's a, uh, according to you know, the Korean traditional marriage. My grandfather and my mother's side grandparents arranged this marriage. Mm -hmm. So without seeing fiancé or <laughs> right. loving other spouse, they just got married. Mm -hmm. So my mother was 19, my father was 15. They married at the Chungcheongdo province, Chanansi. Yeah. And after married, right after one day, my father went to Seoul for middle school, junior high school. So my mother never remembered my father's face. Mm -hmm. She confessed a long time later. Mm -hmm. And my father went to Japan and other places. He was educated. My mother is not educated. She never went to school. As a family household lady, worked hard at home, mm -hmm. taking care of my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And my father came to Korea once a year or twice a year. So I rarely saw him. If I just count all together, I made so my father until 1950, maybe 10, 12 times. So I didn't got any, you know, the influence, any education or, you know, I very, very remember so my father, so I didn't get any influence. So it's primarily your mother. My mother, I mean, uneducated. Mother's you know, <laughs> hard prayer and loving and tender care was my backbone. Grant, Grant. Now you studied political science at Young right. University and then uh, law school at, at UC Davis, right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, how did you 
decided to study international law? When I was 11, no, middle school, junior high school, whenever we received textbook, textbook was distributed by the school at that time, public school. Mm -hmm. And very first page, there's a note. This textbook was published uh, through the assistance from UNESCO. Mm -hmm. I never knew what UNESCO was. Mm -hmm. I thought UNESCO is some person's name. <laughs> my name's Yu Jae Yeah, yeah. UNESCO is <laughs> my family. <laughs> a relative. So, you know, without knowing whether this is a human being or organization, I had a good feeling UNESCO must be good man or a good organization to support Korean children in education. Every textbook was published by UNESCO saying support in 1950. Mm -hmm. Korea became a UNESCO regular member in 1950. But we cannot get into United Nations regular member because we are a divided country. The five five standing permanent, you know, the council member rejected the refused veto power, mm -hmm. particularly Russia and China. So we cannot be a regular member until 1991. But Korea was UNESCO regular member. You know, when I get into high school, I found UNESCO is an international peace organization. So I felt UNESCO is a wonderful organization, helping poor country, helping education for poor people. If I you know, graduate university, I must get a job in UNESCO. That must be fun. I, I found out headquarters in Paris. So Paris is a dream country fighting for us. So I was longing for them. For the international peace and international understanding, I was thinking about going to the Department of International Relations and Political Science. And Yonsei University was one of the famous universities for this you know, international relations, international organization. So I applied there, I was accepted in Yonsei University in four years, and on top of that, I had a two years. Master's degree. My master's thesis is the effective international organization. So I studied it. not only United Nations but also NATO and CETO. This is you know, changed to ASEAN country now, but we have Southeast Asian Treaty organization. So I was studying those NATO and CETO. I proposed NATO, Northeast Asia Treaty organization. Never accomplished yet. But <laughs> my mind, you know, uh, when I was a graduate student, we must have to collect defense mechanism because northeast area, uh, this area is very, very, very you know, fragile area, surrounded by power countries, you know, international politically it is very sensitive area. So we must have this kind of NATO type of. NATO, that's a, my name, but never come true. But anyway, I just went to graduate school. I finished my master's degree. And I luckily got a job at the UNESCO Korean Commission. So after I worked four years, I found you know, my future is very gloomy and not bright. So we now just pay is not that great. And nobody recognized UNESCO. Unless you took a civil civil servant you know, exam or bar exam, become a recognizing you know, bureaucrat or something, this kind of a private NGO type organizational worker is not quite well recognized by the country. So I decided to go to study in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I took an exam and went there. And then you uh, and you said you initially went to BYU. I went to BYU. State, I got master's degree. I wrote the master thesis again, second master, title under company power structure because I majored in political science and you know the plus sociology studies. So community power structure. My formula was how to identify community power leadership structure. Mm -hmm. So you know very rudimentary study, very naive study, but I proposed three different methods to find out community leaders. One is the positional leader, the university president, police chief, mm -hmm. judge, you know, that kind of stuff. Second leader group is a 
recreational leadership. There is uh, retired community leaders who does not have a correct position, but very influential person. Whenever community issue, people go to ask their advice. The third group is decision making. You know, I reviewed five years issue of community. This is a small community population, 20,000. Mm -hmm. Five years, you know, there's no daily newspaper, weekly newspaper. I reviewed all those things. I found several issues, high school band establishment issues, and Saturday you know, free market issues in the community. And I found out who is actively participating in this pro and quo community issues. And I find out about 40 people who are real action oriented leaders, not necessarily reputational leaders or traditional leaders. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed those persons. And I found a very interesting finding. All three group of leaderships are very identical in a small community. I was trying to find out who is a real influential individual in community issues and community life. So there was, you know, I got pick up now, something award, you know. There's a contest of a master thesis, I got number one prize, luckily, <laughs> within nine months of American study. Wow. So I was lucky enough to get that award. It was my only time. <laughs> Ever since, you know, that time. No reward I got. So, <laughs> it, was fun. it was fun. Yeah, and then you went to UC Davis and you practiced right. criminal and immigration law at first. Right. Um, are there any cases or uh, right. legal issues that yeah. helped shape your career? What do yeah. you remember? Okay, after master's degree at University of Utah, I was accepted by a PhD program at University of Washington, mm -hmm. Seattle. And Seattle University of Washington sociology department was very famous at that time. Early 1970, the sociology discipline, there are two groups of good scholars. Number one, functional analysts. They are studying historical, you know, library study. Other one is quantitative analysis study. And in West Washington is very strong in quantitative analysis. But later they were criticized by the quantitative too much artificial. They have developed an index, mm -hmm. something like it. you ask an you know, opinion and you develop the, the formula, strongly agree, agree, sure. with the load, strongly disagree, normally disagree, <laughs> and you just collect all answers and try to analyze the tendency of personality over you know, people's opinion. A little bit artificial. Yeah. So, I was studying sociology. Methodologically, I like to bring, synthesize mm -hmm. quantitative and qualitative together. And again, with my political science background, I studied the, the justice. What is justice? Mm -hmm. I wrote article, little term paper type things for one semester. Frank Miyamoto, he is a professor of sociology, Japanese third generation. Very good professor. He just influenced me a lot. He said, Mr. Yu, why don't you go to law school? <laughs> Justice, we sociologists cannot teach you more. Mm -hmm. So why don't you go to law school? I said, you know, for the law school, if I go to master's or SJD, it will be possible, but JD program, I got my bachelor's program in Korea. So I thought the overseas foreign bachelor cannot get into America. Mm -hmm. So I say, I never thought about it. No, you can't get it there. He, he's going to recommend it to law school. So I was encouraged by him. And I was happy to locate the UC Davis Law School. I studied the background of UC Davis Law School. There are 19 University of California mm -hmm. system, nine, I mean, not 19. Out of nine U system, you know, well known as UCLA and Berkeley. Sure. Right? Of I said them, but you state is a very small compared to Berkeley and Los Angeles. This is a country school, <laughs> start with the agriculture. But you know, recently law school was in there and they nicknamed Martin Luther King Junior Law School. So they are actively soliciting, accepting minority person. So many 
you know, Hispanics and blacks are competing among themselves. But Chinese, Japanese, Koreans are very rare. Particular Koreans are nobody there. So I was the first applicant uh, to the UC Davis Law School. Nowadays, it's quite different share. But 1973, you can imagine. So I'm the only one. So I got a special privilege to accept by then. LSAT Law School after test, and my score is, you know, really <laughs> low. But they give you special, not quite a practical, but, you know, special treatment. So they wanted to make a like, more multicultural class. That's right. Class. So I got this. I was lucky and I, I enjoyed three years of most education there. And I was trying to bring my the sociological, political background of analysis of justice to the philosophy of law, mm -hmm. jurisprudence. Mm -hmm. And I met the right person there, Professor Edgar Bodenheimer. Mm -hmm. He is a you know, German origin. Escape from Nazi dictatorship, he went to America. He taught Minnesota Utah Law School and UC Davis Law School. So I had you know, several class for me why we have to punish individual Christians, you know, philosophy of law, Jewish person. Sure. It was exciting. So rather than practical, you know, criminal law, civil law, evidence, you know, criminal procedure, I am more involved in philosophy of law. That doesn't make much money. Yeah. <laughs> I studied there, and both and I was teachers, you know, the great the philosophers in European tradition. So, Rod Brook, you must know him. Yeah. You know, he's a his teacher, Vienna, and Heidegger. So, I learned a lot of European philosophers' theory from Professor Bodenheim. He has studied strange German accent, I have a Korean accent. So whenever we talk together, there was a lot of fun. Yeah, sure. <laughs> something like a joke or, you know, something television, short time. We just keep talking together. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> the pronunciation is not correct based on American standard. Uh -huh. But we just communicate, you know, effectively. So I learned a lot. And he helped me out. Even if you study law, JD course, and become a lawyer, you have to think about the defendant more, his human rights mm -hmm. and his circumstances, why he become a criminal. And all the law class, they never thought that kind of stuff. They thought just to practical way how to investigate, you know, how to find a criminal procedure, and bare minimum equal protection clause, sure, sure. and right to be you know, helped by competent lawyers. Sure. Amendment 8, you know, all the kind of yeah. stuff, but this man is a human being, a human teacher. So I was deeply influenced by him. Before I met him, I barely know about Hans Kelsen. He's in the theory of states, you know, functional theorism, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, legal spirit is in all of them, but human nature is more spirit, value system is more precious than other systems and you know, legal standards. So I was fully influenced by him. And when I was third year of law school, I found one, one criminal case that is what they call, it's a famous in California, at least, E. Charles case. Mm -hmm. He's a Korean prisoner, Korean immigrant. He was falsely arrested in San Francisco, Chinatown, murder case. For murder. Murder. He never committed the murder. He never been in Chinatown. He was more rather uh, San Francisco, Japan town. But so why was he charged? There's some hidden reasons. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to openly, you know, share sure. uh, states or uh, uh, talk about that. But in 1974, Chinatown, San Francisco is a, the largest Chinatown throughout the whole world. Roughly 25,000 small stores are there, owned by Chinese people. <laughs> Since 1968, the gang rivalry was beginning at the Chinatown. The one group gang is a Joe Boy. They are Hong Kong immigrant. Another one is a, you know, American-born gang. Sure, sure. They were competing each other, but they never killed each other. But since 1968, they started to kill. 
the energy group. Actually, what they do is they are collecting money from small business, you know, shops in store, you know, small business, I mean, gift shops. Uh, they collect one dollar, ten dollar bill. And with that huge amount of money, they are doing social welfare, uh, taking elderly persons. So that's a very tricky, yeah. delicate kind of gang activity. Yeah. Anyway, you know, it, what they are doing is okay, but the procedures and what means and methodologies are not correct and not lead on things. Anyway, they start to kill each other since 1968. So 13 killing was occurred in Chinatown. But San Francisco police never arrested any single person. 1964, no, no, 1974, there's a mayoral election. Mayor was Italian immigrant, you know, somebody else. I don't want to just tell his name, but he was attacked by the Chinatown small merchants. You mayor, you have to arrest this murder. Thirteen murder occurred in Chinatown. You arrested none. So people is hesitating to come to our shop. So we are almost, you know, close our doors, 25,000 stores. So you got to arrest any, you know, persons. So this mayor, six months away from the re-election, he ordered the police chief, you got to arrest any single person, because any single person became a clue 10 years later when he had no trial. And police chief ordered, you know, special inspectors and investigators, we got to arrest him this time. Otherwise, mayor and police chief would be, you know, <laughs> sure, in big trouble. So it's political. So political case. So they arrested one guy, you know, immigrated from Korea. Mother is illiter illiterate, you know, no father. Chuck was 19 years old at that time. He was an immigrant. Immigrant. He went to America when he was 11 years old. His mother was interracially married. He married. She married an American GI. Went to America, had a one daughter, and he left son to her sister zone. But when Charles was 11 years old, mom came to Korea and you know, took his son to San Francisco. And mother was not educated; she just had two jobs from four o'clock in the morning, labor job most of the many of them. So she cannot take care. She couldn't take care of the son very well. So son became a street boy. But he's a good hard guy. He never involved in any gang or steal anything. Just a sweet boy, you know. He just still walked at the Korean restaurant as a bus boy, dishwasher, you know, very little one dish. He's not interested in the screen. So he's just not Boy Scouts person, but he's not clean like that. But he was arrested. He was tried by you know, white judge, white prosecutors. White, white juries and white attorneys, court appointed attorney, three weeks trial, murder trial. Middle of the trial, the Hamilton Hitz is our attorney. He was you know, attacked by a heart, heart attack. But any reasonable attorney, you and I know, must have filed a motion to continuation. Sure. But he didn't file any motion, you know, get it away. So he went to hospital. So he was convicted and life sentence was someone. So he was in prison, Stockton, near San Francisco. Stockton is a very volatile place. 1,200 youth criminals are there. Among 1,200, there are three gang groups. Number one, white Aryan brothers. They are all sweet, sure. You know, white Aryan. Second group, black Kerala. Third one is Mexican Mafia. The fourth group is only one, Korean Mafia, he chose to. You know, he, he worked hard. He knew if he worked hard, he could be released under the parole or some, you know, more case. So he worked hard very well. The prison authority recognized his hard work, so he, you know, gave him a job at the work at the kitchen mm -hmm. using life. Unless you are more than a prisoner, you never be in the kitchen. Just be sure. <laughs> so he was working there. 
four years has passed, and he's still working hard. And one day, white Aryan Bush leader conspired, conspired with all of the other members who was trying to kill this guy. Why? They thought Charles is close to the Mexican mafia. He was in a car similar, so he was close to Mexican mafia. <laughs> so they conspired. Prison guard heard that, you know, conspired conspiration. I married him person when I defended that case. Anyway, 1977, October 8th, it's a late heat of the, you know, California, Northern California, very warm day. Tank, you know, without sleep. It's a one hour of exercise time, 12 o'clock. And the you know, exercise guard, Charles was team tank, and he went out there. When he came into the, the exercise ground, they just searched with the metal detective. And another guy, white leader, he was a sweatshirt. He just hide a knife under his shirt. He was there. And it just reminds me high on Gary Cooper's move <laughs> at the 12 o'clock and yeah. he just uh, two seconds. You know, big guy was fall down. Charles was successfully retreated himself. And you know, police I mean prison guard saw it. They just ran to the van and they arrested Charles. Charles defends the self-defense sure. And prison gave him first degree murder. Anyway. But for First in his trial four years ago in San Francisco. Yeah. Second case never gonna be happened. I just told them to the prosecutor, they said, but for theory is now an illegal system. So but for that's work. So try to se separate. Mm -hmm. So we tried the second case, first case. First case was through the habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. We are very lucky. As you know, American legal system, habeas corpus is uh, one out of one million cases. The nice church, Mr. Carlton is a ACL church. Mm -hmm. He is a lawyer skill type, not American Bar Association. <laughs> Very good man. He just uh, ordered a new trial. One of a million case. So we just uh, re formulated all those things. I spent uh, three months to investigate all those things. We are trying to find out witness at the four years ago. So we had a new trial. We won the first case. Mm -hmm. Second case, you know, we will be able to win this one for self-defense, but he has been in prison almost 10 years. And the prosecutor you know, asked him, why don't you have a plea bargain? He will release immediately without any condition. No parole, no probation, no deportation, just free. Mm -hmm. Just to accept the second degree order. So the so, you just see, it's free. I talk too much about this case. Now, I was <laughs> not sorry <laughs> about you know, touch the case, but any lawyer, any criminally interested lawyer, it's uh, nothing. That's my major case. And after that, you know, unfortunately, I had so many small cases in Los Angeles. I was so busy. <laughs> you know, law firm, people are lining up. <laughs> you know, Korean immigrant heard about J.U. is a good lawyer, he has a good heart. He worked seven years without as a pro bono, mm -hmm. without any fee charge. So I, we have to bring our case to him. I can't, I can't handle all those. <laughs> really, really overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Too many cases. So I, after that, some you know child molesting case. Mm -hmm. Korean grandfather at the open public park. He touched the four years old boy in an mm -hmm. important place. He was arrested. So I defended him, you know, cultural differences mm -hmm. in Korea. For the grandfather, he's a 75 years old, as a, you know, expression of loving mm -hmm. tender gesture, mm -hmm. different culture. You know, we have to establish school for the new immigrant to learn American legal system. So why don't you release him like this? So he was released. But that kind of non-legal, comparative cultural lecture, I've done many cases. <laughs> Los Angeles PDs, and this came from Bodenheim's philosophy law. If I didn't take that case, I never imagined that kind of stuff. I thought American law so strict, so we have to abide the law. 
if you violate no excuse, no defense, you have to go by law. But your judge is human being, sure. Defendant is human being. Even attorney, if he is he's not greedy, mm -hmm. if he's a good heart, he can proceed to judge. And even 12 jurors. As you hear, my English or Korean English. You know, I have three children born in America. They keep teasing <laughs> daddy. You still speak Korean English. <laughs> but American jurors, that's what I appeal. Sure. But they saw my in depth, my heart. So trial is nothing but human affairs and human relationship that is put connecting. You're right. You know, this is a footnote. For the court system in California, when you have a continuation of your case, this is an emergency case, then you cannot continue by phone. You have to appear at the court. Mm -hmm. But my case, I just called to Judy, age 65, law clerk. One more week, okay, Jane, you know, I got it. But the other American, you know, real, excuse me, my expression, you know, white, honky, yeah. lawyer, they can't make it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you were busy in LA, you had a lot of clients, you had a lot of, you know, fame. Mm -hmm. Why did you come back to Korea? Well, this is a very dramatic thing. I had uh, some video tape from Korea, mm -hmm. and I watched it, I was really shocked. There's a television debate program. We never had this kind of thing before. But, you know, Korea became a democratized 1987 mm -hmm. when President Mo Tae Woo, you know, ordered, I mean, declared it to the public that we are going to elect our president directly. Mm -hmm. And that's a study of democratization of Korean study. And 1990, three years later, KBS and NBC, those two television start to have a debate program. Mm -hmm. Before that moment, it is very difficult to criticize government and ruling party government and the, what government is doing. But it was loosened. So civilian persons and civil organization start to criticize and evaluate. So television stations start the debate program. And NBC television tape I acquired and I watched it. Kune was up here, and mm -hmm. now she is a, a president candidate. But that time she is a simple daughter of former president Park Chan mm -hmm. And one of the, my friends, you know, you and I went to the same high school, Park Jung Jae, he's a lawyer, so he was moderator. Mm -hmm. He keep asking questions to Park Kune. Park Jung Park Jung Park Jung responded it. So fun. And one particular, you know, the discussion exchange between two persons. Park Jong-hee asked me, do you know your father's, you know, heavy dealing with a woman? And Doro answered, yeah, I knew. I heard many rumors that my father loved making, you know, sure. acquaintance with a woman. What's wrong with it? And this is a really amazing discussion <laughs> in public television, sure. as a daughter of a former president. So I was, wow, that was a nice problem. I like to be a moderator or you know, TV, the MC, sure. and it, that's it, you know, I can't do it, I, I have to work at Los Angeles, and two weeks later, the NBC people called me, and Park kyung has some problem, mm -hmm. he cannot continue that thing, some of his personal problems, mm -hmm. so they are looking for the MC person, mm -hmm. the moderator, sure. so, some reason they contacted me. So I was very, you know, excited about it. So I went, came down to Korea. Mm -hmm. So I went to NBC television station, and there are six, seven persons, including president. They interviewed me about three hours. So I answered, you know, they just to check my voice, my you know, audio and video. You know. <laughs> I, I didn't make up, but you know, I just naturally do a lot of things. And two of them are my university alumni. They know me. I was the MC you know, when I was a high university kid. And after this interview, final decision was flunky. Mm -hmm. Two reasons. Number one, I've lived 20 years in America, so uh -huh. to be a moderator, you know, analyze and effectively, you know, 
traffic control must be difficult for me. Whenever we had you know, the politicians try and go on heated the debate, it will be difficult for myself. That's a their decision. I say, you know, that's not true. I've been watching, you know, carefully, you know, follow up what's going on in Korea. So I knew what's going on, but they decided that. And second is my voice. Many people say my voice is really good, but they found out my voice is some nasal sound. <laughs> so, so two weeks in different house, so you know, forget that I went back to Los Angeles. And, you know, my law practice was pretty good, you know, just to talk about money like that. And two weeks later, you know, the party leader Kim Young sap he became a president. You know, he invited me for having a a special seminar for human rights of overseas Koreans. Mm -hmm. So they selected me to brief about human rights. You know, they asked me to say about each of the cases in Korea, almost two million Koreans are living in America. So they sent me air fair. So I, went, I came down to Seoul and I made a you know, half an hour speech, a little bit emotional speech. It was just me. Inevitably, you have to involve the emotion. And NBC cameraman heard it. Later, he confessed to me, he dropped it here. And he went back to NBC and said, you know, one you know, little fat, short guy, <laughs> a boy from America, he presented a bunch of three cases. I was really impressed. I even cried. Why don't you invite him for this, you know, up until that time, two weeks, they couldn't find out moderator. Mm. So, when I met upper person, president, other person, I was flunking. Mm. But no, because he's a labor union member. Mm. When he just introduced me to the program, they accepted me. So I went there. Wow. That is the beginning of my television show. So I had three and a half years every week. Mm -hmm. And my office was closed six months later, and my wife joined me. And meantime, I was president of Kyawan University. Mm -hmm. I taught law and administrative. And I just completed this program. This program disappeared. Later, it was reappeared. But so about six months, I was enrolled in school and teaching. And KBS, Midnight Live Talk Show, invited me again. We are looking for a new guy. So I went there at KBS, so I had the two years there. Mm -hmm. So all together, five and a half years, every weekend. So no relax, no you know, vacation. I just do it. it was fun. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed it very much. And Kim Dejan, former president, watched it he was there mostly. And he just induced me to support his president. You know, That's how you met each other. That's the reason why. You know, when I look back, my ambition, my wish, my goal was not really clear. I was led by invisible hand. <laughs> you know, there's a Christian you know, confession. I think God leads me here and there. So up until today, this day, I was led by some strong hands, I guess. Sure. So you started in politics, mm -hmm. then moved to sociology, mm -hmm. and law, mm -hmm. and TV. So when I <laughs> moderated TV, mm -hmm. my, you know, the shallow knowledge of social science, this mm -hmm. law and economics and you know, sociology and political science mm -hmm. in the university, it works nicely. Mm -hmm. So even now, many people surprised me when you moderate the debate program, that was the more. <laughs> I think my background has helped me a great deal, even if I didn't dig in depth, you know, but I just shoveled and touched into this and that. So it was, it was at that point you actually started to engage in Korean politics? That's right, that's right. Um, so you, when, when you're represented with the National Assembly, you dealt mainly with foreign affairs, mm -hmm. um, national, national defense? That's right, I was the chairman of the National Defense Committee. When I, you know, visit United Nations 2001, mm -hmm. I had a chance to talk to the audience there. Mm -hmm. And presider, assistant secretary general on the Kofi Annan era, 
he introduced me. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'd like to introduce Chairman of the National Defense Committee. There are two Chairman of the National Defense in Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. One is in Pyongyang, Kim, so and so. Another one is Mr. <laughs> Yu from South School. <laughs> so I went to the podium. Ladies and gentlemen, so nice to meet you. The presider's introduction is quite correct. Title was exactly the same title. However, mm -hmm. substantive power is something like a heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. <You know? laughs> it was fun. Mm -hmm. National Defense Committee, I oversaw, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps. I enjoyed very much. While, you know, my tenure as the chairman of the National Defense Committee, we decided to send our troops to, you know, Iraq, China. It was very serious debate we went through. And we established new DAPA, you know, military the acquisition department. It wasn't there at that time. Each army, navy, air force acquired things. Every time when they purchased one airplane, you know, defense committee, you know, committee chairperson go to jail. When we just purchased one each single you know, submarine ship, you know, another four-star general was arrested. There's so much corruption and bad, you know, that drop. So we are trying to make a one body, you know, for timely acquisition and you know reduce our price, you know, all that kind of stuff. So while I was chairman of Defense Defense, yeah, we established a new agency. So first year, second year, we reduce our one third of the budget for purchasing for tools and weapons and mm -hmm. you know. So that's you know I probably talk to people that it was really good period of my time. And also for twelve years, you know, defense chairman was only three years. Mm -hmm. And I was vice chair of the Foreign Relations Unification and Trade Committee. Mm -hmm. So I traveled all of the countries and you know auditing and inspecting and creating this people whether they are doing okay or not. And I found many unfortunate things also. Mm -hmm. Some are encouraging, some are very frustrating things. You know, it, it's very shameful to say, but for the future good diplomatic trainings and good diplomacy of Korean government, I can just tell to the public. One country I beat, you know, unfavorable country, mm -hmm. somewhere in Africa. Ambassador never ate in local people. Mm -hmm. He never tried to learn, you know, the language of that country. Mm -hmm. That's a bad thing. Sure. He's waiting for three years to go to Washington DC. Mm -hmm. That's no good. I just keep talking to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We have to train the good diplomat. Mm -hmm. Not just to accept who passed the exam. We have a national exam for diplomas. I mean, diploma. diploma. Simply just to passing, you know, written exam doesn't work. Mm -hmm. You have their personality, how much you like this, many character. I mean, the traits you have to see. So now, since this year, we opened a new academy for foreign language, foreign relations, foreign diploma or something. Mm -hmm. So we started a new system. I think that I just uh, started it when I was in the National Assembly, so I'm very much proud to see the result of this thing. So I think it a much better system than pure exam. Mm -hmm. So while you worked in the Kim dae jung administration in Nomi Khan, there were great strides made between the North and South uh, relationship and reunification, but you know, as of today, there is you know, there, there has been no unification um, or peace agreement. Could you evaluate the policy of the most recent administration, the Yimba administration, with regards to the North right. South relation? When Yimba ran for the president as a candidate, mm -hmm. he pledged the promise to people the, the denuclearization 3000. Mm -hmm. That means if North Korea give up nuclear development, then we'll make North Korea protect the income $3,000. Mm -hmm. So that is that we realized yet. You know, it, it was just an even close. 
and relation to North and South is very cold, and not even one step forward. I was working with Kim Dae-jung, you know, I supported Sunshine Policy, sure. and Sunshine Policy is at that moment most reasonable, the approach to North Korea. The basic assumption of the, the Sunshine Policy is not, you know, Anderson's episode of a fairy tale type thing. If you, you know, the fairy tale, you remember, the two persons competing each other, one is trying to, you know, the strangers quote who is going to, you know, make him take up, mm -hmm. and strong sunshine make him hot and take up, and strong wind, <laughs> and he will just, I want to be watched, unintentionally, his quote will be, taking out. So such a policy that kind of idea started. But the basic assumption is North and South's competition for past is completely out. We won. North Korea was, you know, really devastated. Two million North Koreans were starved to death in the past decade. That's a very miserable thing. And still protect income less than you know thousand dollars. Sometime nineteen early nineteen seventy, with you know the, the development of some industry, North Korea was relatively better than South Korea. Sure. But we work so hard now it's uncomparable. They are not our you know competitor. We won already. So we have to take care of our people. Twenty two million Korean brothers and sisters are there. My father was taken to North Korea, so you know, 10 years ago when I was in National Assembly, I thought my father, if he's alive, he must be somewhere in North Korea. We like to care for those persons. So unification is must necessary. I don't think anybody in South Korea, you know, refuse or deny for the unification issue. But how, when, that's a different. So Sunshine Policy assumes that we don't need to hurry up to unification as divided two party, two entity, we have to help each other to peacefully live each other and exchange human exchange or you know the economic exchange and support each other. And someday when time right democratically, peacefully we have to unite it together. But let's not have a blood in Korean punishment. There also a will to be in Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il. That's a 2001, July 13. So that's like and a peace, uh, peace you know, agreement for five things. Many people criticize about this one, but I think that's a good document and good agreement between two. And throughout the whole history of division, that is the first and most you know, supportive the Soviet conference between two. And some people criticize that Kim Dae-jung is a pro-North Korea. He just uh, supported North Korea without any, you know, return. So North Korea dictator, with the supporting assistant money, they developed nuclear. So he, you know, really aggravated in a North South relationship. That's a you know, and he supports idea. I don't believe so. 2001, before he went to Pyongyang, he asked me to visit America. So I went to former Minister of Defense, Perry, Army Kaiser, you know, all those you know, think tanks. Uh, I spent a half month in America. I briefed them, Mr. Kim Dae-jung is going to visit North Korea. What kind of thing he has to bring to them? And could you give advice now our way to Kim dae -jung? It's a secret. It's not open to the news or anything, so I just came here as a secret, you know, the agent, whatever, around. So why don't you give me a? So I met about 20 persons, including the Victor Cha mm -hmm. and Michael Green, and so all those people, and they advised me, you know, this is a real amazing approach to you know, engagement policy. You have to engage North Korea. Mm -hmm. They are just to, you know, youngest brat type thing. You know, they just unreasonably doing, you know, 
out of common sense things. So you have to take care of them and bring them to normal society, normal international community. So that is a very good idea. So why don't you tell Kim Dae Jong if you would like to support you? And when I, when I met Ami Tase, what's your advice? And he said, ask Kim Dae Jong to buy Louis XIV, the you know, liquid army. <laughs> I don't know, but they will see that kind of stuff. Kim Jong il likes that mm. you know, expense movie. That's a $1,500 for one dollar. I don't know. They will see, you know, joke. Anyway, so I supported the policy. Now we are having presidential election in Korea. Moon Jong in and An Chul Su. Mm. Those two persons declared yes, as of yesterday. About yesterday, they didn't show to the public their idea to the North Korean policy. We were both of them very similarly. We support Sunshine Paris, but little conditional point. Not Kim Dejun type of Sunshine Paris. They have their own Sunshine Paris. We are trying to engage in them. Mm -hmm. But you know, dismantle nuclear. And we have to assist them economically. So those things to work together. And for that purpose we have to propose peace treaty. Mm -hmm. North Korea keep talking about peace treaty. 1953, July 27, we had the troops that signed mm -hmm. three countries. South Korea is not that many part of Korea. So 2001, when Kim Jong-il and Kim Dae-jung went there in North Korea, Pyongyang, I was just in the middle close there. They decided to say that is not written statement. We have to move to peace treaty. When peace treaty signed, the main party was to North and South. And the participation of war, China and America must be insured. And six party top member, Japan and Russia must be assured. I think that's a beautiful moment. So those we are first time in our world history recognize South Korea as a main party. Over to that time, North Korea's claim is, you are not right party. America is our party. Mm -hmm. So we are dealing with North Korea. South Korea is a perfect regime. Sure. You just follow America. You know, ROK and US alliance. What is that? That is a colony treaty. So if we deal with America, South Korea is our man. That's their claim. But since 2001, Kim Dae Jung, Kim Jong Il summit. They say, let's do peace treaty between South and North. Other party must be, you know, surrounded, insured or assured. I think that's a good format. So I think the new president must pursue that idea. And even Park Geun Hye, they like to honor second summit, No Myon and Kim Jong Il because this young guy come. That is a 2007, October 4, October. Yeah. That agreement is we are trying to support them economically. Our budget is big problem. People criticize about we don't have that much money, but at least we can discount half. The significant thing is a Kaesong industrial part. That's a very wonderful idea. We may expand, we may make more of those things. It's not easy, but South Korean leadership must to develop high class diplomatic strategy mm -hmm. dealing with you know, North Korea. My idea is they are not our competitor. Kim Jong Il Young Bak say, you know, you know, don't look down us. We are ready to fight. You know, you know, normal reciprocity. When you give you, you have to give to, back to us. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So. The result is no good. Iman Bak is still incumbent, but after he is completed his you know, presence of duty, I think the theorists or uh, theory, uh, I mean the scholars and political critics will criticize him as a failure, I believe. So new leadership is coming up pretty soon. They have to take management of if North Korea hear this one, they would feel bad about it, but you know, among us, we have to manage North Korea nicely. No bloody Korean Peninsula, no war, peacefully. It'll take some time. 
you know, democracy itself is two functions. Takes time, time consuming, and expense. We have to practice this democratic way to deal with North Korea. I don't have much time to in in detail explanation about this one, but still new type of engagement policies are necessary. I think we will just to pursue that. Do you think it can be easier with Kim Jong un or does it you know the changing of the I think it'll be easier. He is a Switzerland educated guy. You know, when he just took his wife to the public, it's the first time. Mm -hmm. And Mickey Mouse show, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. That's a, his wife's idea, I heard. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's a true or not, but they are trying to open it a bit. Is that, is, is that a message to their own people or to South or to the world? I mean, why are they publicizing all the, the photos to and the outings? To the Americas and South and all of all, all, all. We are ready to change if you give us. If you just to treat us as a you know good country, not you know low country mm -hmm. like a pussy era, sure. low statement was really you know agitated. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake by you know, President Bush. It's all over. But anyway, they like to be treated as a you know gentleman state, mm -hmm. even if you know they are doing all those uncommon things. Anyway, it's a symptom to me. And Kim Jong Un got all the information from. Open the operation of China, Deng Xiaoping's idea. Mm -hmm. And also, he learned Vietnam model in order to survive. And, you know, he's only 30 years old, 29 or 30. He was educated in Switzerland, middle school, high school. And he, he reads English and French. Mm -hmm. And he knows what's going on in the world. He knows it was inevitable to open the world, even minimum or partially, mm -hmm. otherwise they cannot survive. Up until this day, up until his daddy, grandfather and father, they are you know, strong weapon, strong world as a nuclear. Mm -hmm. But they test with Bush and Obama even. Mm -hmm. They thought Obama is just you know, weak guy. You know, but nuclear only doesn't work. They found out this way. So they have to make him out use and lady to appear at those days. And new new era came. I think much, much better than before. That's my analysis, but some experts say different word, but it will be better. Do you think he commands the same respect as his father did or does he have the same power that his father did? That is a question over now. Now he's anti father's younger sister mm -hmm. and her husband Chang Sang Teng. Uncle and uncle, you know, and uncle. Those are real, you know, power person. They are controlling this young leader. But now I'm is sick, that's what I heard. Mm -hmm. So the military persons are shrinking now. Mm -hmm. As of yesterday, the one soldier came you know, to the south from North yeah. by killing two, you know, these officers. Officers mm -hmm. in this country. North Korea didn't react yet. We are, you know, keenly awaiting you know, what's going on in North Korea. I, I presume that as uh, the military is actually here to me about this man is a military person, age 28, suddenly he became a four-star general. <laughs> and that's an unre unreasonable thing, but they are well doctrinated, indoctrinated in that way, but still information goes in there. Many people are secretly listening to South Korea. Uh, they probably know, you know, Gangnam style. You know, <laughs> you know, it's amazing society now. Yeah. Many persons doing internet mm -hmm. and you know, learning those things. So I think they will change. Otherwise, they cannot. But they just to still maintain, catch some industrial power activity. Sure. And unreliable source, but. You know, Kim Jong wants to do two or three more Kesson stack. Mm -hmm. That means corporate with South mm -hmm. while they are strongly you know, against military. Mm -hmm. But that's just a gesture. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the situation will be getting better. And what about in terms of the what about in terms of the six party talks? You said it was, you know, a perfect, you know, situation or perfect organization. Do you have any suggestions for moving forward? Six way talk. 
he didn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. But why we are co continuing discussion, you know, those Yangpyeongdo incident or Pyongyangdo incidents mm -hmm. are taking, they will never happen. So we have to continue to dialogue. We have to continue to open the channel. Mm -hmm. Six party talk as a effective in channeling and dialogue and communicating with them. We cannot get a real you know, outcomes or resolution of those, but still it's a valid. Mm -hmm. While they are talking more and more, more information is getting into North Korea. So someday we may just have some or something, but when you look back this party talk we had you know, four or five times already. Mm -hmm. Does not much, but at least while they are discussing, you know, discussion table, it's kind of round the table in Beijing, and really actual confrontation wasn't happened at that time. Mm -hmm. So keep dialogue is important to maintain peace. You know, the, the Sunshine policy criticized you know, people who are criticizing this one say, you know, we just give too much to North Korea. They just this one, not for the you know, welfare of the people, they just developed the nuclear. But they just didn't see positive aspect. 2001, after North and South, Kim Dae Jung and Kim Jong Un signed the declaration. You know, many American the investor came to Korea and they invest money. Mm -hmm. So our stock market opened up, mm -hmm. so we can reasonably. You know, export so many things. We became, you know, the seventh, eighth largest trading country. Such a divided small country. It's amazing. Sure. I believe no South Summit conference won't support this, you know, incident. I mean, this phenomenon. That many people count this way. You know, people say, oh, they said there's a no war in Korean Peninsula. If there's a war, who's going to invest in it? Sure. Uh, you had mentioned at the beginning of the interview that one of your inspirations was seeing the UNESCO mm -hmm. sign in right. the textbooks. Mm -hmm. So you're working with UNESCO and other NGOs now. That's right. Could you explain a little bit now, about what you mean? I retired from the National Assembly. I became a president of the UNESCO Federation of the Crops and Association. We have about 1,000 members and 23 local clubs. Annually, we are having a national convention. This week, Friday, we are going to have a national convention in Ulsan. Okay. So about 800 to 1,000 people gather there. I'm going to lecture them one hour. The peace. You know, UNESCO is peace organization. They said, at their preamble, they said, war become, you know, war from the human being's mind. The defense of war must be start from human mind. Mm. For that, we have to exchange you know, each country, so we have to wear you know, our friends' shoes to understand each other. So we are actively participating in exchange program, youth, adult, and school teachers. Last week, I went to the Kazakhstan, Almaty. We had the three days conference. I spoke there as a keynote speaker under the globalized area, how we're going to continue our peace education to use people. And I told to them, you know, Northeast Asia, where I came from, as a territory fight between um, China, Japan, and Korea, still kind of 67 years after UNESCO was formed, we had about 150 confrontations in war, and the American ambassador in Syria was assassinated the sixth time. And Samuel Huntington's you know, conflict of the civilization is occurred in the Middle East. UNESCO, what we can do, what we have to teach our young people. You know, we are here, our religion, Muslim, Russian Orthodox, Buddhist, Hindu, Confucianism, Christianity, Catholic, you know, core values. Two things. Core is peace and love your name. Every religion shows and taught them, but still we are fighting. So UNESCO's peace idea is a learning to live together. We have to teach this one. It may be on top of the religious you know, behavior activity, but humbly 
we have to go under the ground. We have to teach children. For that, we have to exchange more so they can learn from the country. That 40 people come to Korea, they can learn Korea. And we have to show them our natural, national treasure, like the country. It's dancing on UNESCO. So I'm really very actively involved in UNESCO activity. Not many people are aware about this one, but this is a very significant community education program. So I'll just keep doing that. Another one is a youth hostel activity. Mm -hmm. I'm president of that organization. We have 25,000 members. So when they are traveling to Europe and country, they are staying with you know, a reasonable price, you source there. There's a chatting room, dialogue room with the foreign young people. They keep talking about peace. So we can grasp the result right now. It's a small planting of peace education thing. So I just keep doing that. Great. Um, and finally, just to wrap up, uh, international law is becoming more important and focused on East Asia. Um, and many young Asian scholars are interested in studying international law. What advice would you give these scholars who are just starting out? <laughs> Maybe not many students are really interested in learning, at least in Korean case, they are more interested in getting a job. They have to learn you know, what subject is necessary for them to get a job. Samsung, Hyundai, you know, good pay you know, organization. But international law, international organization has very you know, not practical sometimes, but it has great impact on human life, ourselves and other persons in other countries. So international relationship or international law, the basic thing is a human being. That's what I learned from Professor Bodena. Country to country, treaty, so they are with the bond, but many countries breach the contract many times. United League. They just in 1919, they said, let's have a peace. And they agreed upon, you know, three times in you know, Sweden, but war broke out. After second of the United Nations, UNESCO, many peace organizations occurred. Still conflicts are going on. So most important thing is loving your neighbor. You know, we have to think about live and learning to live together with others. That's a, you know, Basic of the peace idea. So international law is going to be a peace. It's not war. Mm -hmm. Not just to competitively acquire other countries of the hegemony. So human beings is important thing. So I like to recommend to those students who are interested in international law take psychology, sociology, even briefly. Mm -hmm. So broad knowledge is very important. Mm -hmm. That is my advice. Okay. Well, thank you.